Let's pick up here in verse 8 in Hebrews chapter 11. I'll read to verse 16. We're looking at Abraham uh, and Sarah, but especially we'll be looking at the faith of Abraham and building on that as we look at the chapter. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she called him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham. Abraham, when you look at the Bible, is the greatest example of faith that you will find from the Old to the New Testament. Even here in chapter 11, as we begin to look at the Hall of Faith, and we've already seen men like Abel and Enoch and Noah, even though they are great testimonies of trusting God, Abraham is referred to in Scripture as being even greater. He's used as an example of faith. You see this in both the Old Testament as well as the New. An example in the Old Testament is found in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 9, verses 7 and 8, when the, uh, the priests were praying during the time of national repentance. And as they were praying, this is what they said. They said, You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you. In the Old Testament, he is regarded as a man of faith. In the New Testament, he is an example of how one receives relationship with God. Various places refer to the faith that Abraham exhibited in the New Testament. Romans chapter 4, for example, verse 3 says, What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 says, Just as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for for righteousness. James says in chapter 2, verse 23, the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. And so you see him as the greatest example of faith in both the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. This is a man who lived some 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, but is also a picture not only of faith, but also of the grace of God. Because this is a man who lived in southern Iraq in a place called Ur of the Chaldees on the Euphrates River. During the days of Abraham, Ur of the Chaldees was a sophisticated pagan city. Sometimes we will consider um, cities in terms of the history and, and all in, in antiquity, and we may be thinking, well, these people were a bunch of, uh, you know, unsophisticated individuals, and that's just not true. You can see some incredible ruins of cities that existed, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago that will make any of the modern cities that we have look really um, poor in comparison. Ur of the Chaldees was such a city. Ur had a system of writing, advanced mathematics. It had educational facilities. It was also religious, a paganly religious city because they worshiped the moon god who was called Namu. And they also have unearthed uh, uh, the royal cemetery and they find that they had ritual burials that were sealed with human sacrifice. So it was a sophisticated city, but it was a very pagan city. And this is a place that he lived. Now, before God called Abraham, he had a family, a history of idolatry. Jewish tradition, and I hasten to add the word tradition. Jewish tradition holds that his father, Terah, was an idol maker and one thing is certain concerning him, he was an idolater. Now, how do we know that? 
Well, we know that he was an idolater because it's stated in Joshua, in the Old Testament book of Joshua, 24 verses 2 and 3. Because there it says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt in the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Machor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. So he says they served other gods. And so tradition holds that, that Terah was an idol maker. We don't know that for sure. But the Bible does state that he was an idolater and that Abraham came from a family of idolaters. Now, in the midst of this idolatry, in the midst of this pagan, sophisticated city, God begins a work of grace. And by God's grace, Abraham is called. In Acts 7, 2 and 3, Stephen says, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. And so God showed him grace, and God called him out of the midst of idolatry and took him to a land that he was going to give to him. And by the grace of God, he left his country to follow the Lord. And so we're looking at a man by the name of Abraham, and that's what we see here in verse 8 when he begins to explain to us the life of this man. He says in Hebrews eleven eight, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place he would afterward receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. And so by faith, Abraham obeyed. Once again, we see a life of faith that begins with a step of obedience. If you speak concerning faith in God, it'll always be tied together with obedience. So God spoke and he moved. That gives us insight that faith obeys God's commands. Genesis 12, 1, which is in reference to this call, says, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And Genesis 12, 4 says, Abraham Abram departed as the Lord spoke to him, and Lot went with him. And so we see him taking God at his word. The Bible says he went to a place he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And so his obedience was an outward evidence of an inward faith. Obedience, faith are always coupled together, producing something called works. A person says, I have faith in God. Their faith in God is always evidenced by a consistency in their walk. Our faith, my faith, is always going to be demonstrated by activity, not just intellectual or theoretical, not just something philosophical. It's going to be beyond that. It's going to be something that is active, something that is real. You know, I have a book. I forget the title. It's okay. Please take my word for it. I do have a book. And this book speaks concerning the giving habits of, of Americans. It was done by an individual who was raised with a religious uh, background, but who had, from a political perspective, what we would today call liberal bent. So he was from a liberal perspective politically, but he was from a religious background in terms of a Christian faith. And so he did some research in this particular book to write it, to discover who are the most generous people, the liberals. This is his words, by the way, liberals or conservatives. Who are the most generous people? Now, I know that we, as Americans, get sold on the idea constantly that, that if you're very liberal, you are also very generous. I mean, don't we see our actors and actresses marching for the cause of, of, of baby seals and, and darter snails and various other little things? I mean, don't they really care about these things? I, they're, they're worried about the spotted owl. Most certainly, they must be concerned about human beings also. He said he did his initial research and had such a problem with it because he had a bias, and the bias was that liberalism is more generous than conservatism. I mean, that's what he'd been heard, hearing all his life. He did his initial research, and then he did it a second time, because when he found the first time that conservative people, especially religious people, are much more generous than the liberals, he had a real problem with that. Because philosophically, he believed that if you were liberal, that meant generous. See, the word liberal speaks concerning generosity, and therefore he thought that they were generous not only in, in mentality, but also with their money, and it turns out they're not. It turns out that they had, a, as an experiment, they put a, a man out, a Salvation Army guy, with, a, with, a, with his little bucket and his little bell, and they put him in San Francisco, and they also put one in, I believe it was Des Moines, Iowa, the heart of conservatism, and in cities that were similar in population in terms of size and all of that. He put one in San Francisco, the other in this conservative city, and uh, they just saw how much was collected, and it turns out that the people in the conservative city 
outgave those in the, in the uh, liberal city by so much that it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. And so he came to realize that part of the reason why people are not generous in, in, with liberal persuasion is because they believe that their money is already going to good causes. That's why they're so behind um, bureaucracies. That's why they're so behind, um, you know, using our taxes for good and all. But it turns out that the religious people are actually the more generous people because religious people have a graciousness about them. Religious people understand pain, and many of them are not wealthy. As a matter of fact, the average religious person is anything but wealthy. But what he is generous, or she is generous in, is faith. And they are generous in their giving. They are generous people because they have seen what the Lord has done. And, and what that means is that we have an understanding, we who are believers in Christ, we have an understanding that we have received, and therefore we ought to give. Because Jesus said unto us, didn't he say it is more blessed to give than to receive? Well, this is part of our heart. This is how we are as people, whereas those who have no faith or fear in God, of God, don't have the same kind of motivation, and therefore they get upset when they say, well, the, I already give, I give through my taxes. I don't have to give to somebody in a, in a charitable situation whatsoever. That's why I find it uh, um, amazing and amusing that sometimes people make a big deal out of a multimillionaire who gives a $100,000 gift because that's not even touching his revenue. That's not even touching anything that that person has. I mean, that's a tax write-off. I was amazed uh, a few years ago when, um, I forget what the fellow's name is, but he's from uh, Atlanta, and he's a billionaire. His first name is Ted, but I can't remember his last name. Turner, Ted Turner, that, that he challenged other, billion, other billionaires to give... Uh, to give $100 million, I think it was something like that, to give $100 million to charity, and he chose to do something like that. I forget if it was a billion or a hundred million. It's a great sum of money, but what he chose to do is give it over a course of 10 years, and so he divided it up over 10-year increments, and, and he gave his money, and people were applauding his generosity, but me, I realize that you get tax write-offs when you do things like that, and I don't see that as an act of generosity so much as money management, and I didn't see him give uh, uh, the amount of money in one lump sum I saw him give it over the course of 10 years, which taken into consideration inflation over 10 years, it reduces the initial amount that he promised over 10 years of inflation. And so I thought of that, and I thought, that's not a generous thing to do at all. But the world did. The world said, how, how generous is that? Well, you know what? I wouldn't mind if he would have given it to me. I'd use it for the Lord. But the bottom line is Christians are by far more generous. Why? Because we know that faith and action works together. How do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us that. In James chapter 2, verse 18, someone will say, you have faith, I have works. But he goes on to say, show me your faith without works. I will show you my faith by my works. And so faith and works are hand in hand. And so obedience demonstrates that you have faith. And that's what's taking place in the life of Abraham. The Bible tells us that he left home by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. He left home. Leaving home is one of the hardest things a person can do. Uh, my kids haven't discovered that yet, but they will one day. Leaving home is one of the more difficult things that an individual can do. This is a person who left his home. This is a person who left his country. You don't realize how much you love your country until you leave it for a while. When you go into a foreign land, you may have these vague ideas of how romantic it would be to live in such a beautiful country, we'll say, as Italy, and to live in Tuscany, because there's so many movies that, are, that show us Tuscany. Or, or perhaps you, you see a, a movie that, that shows London, and you think, man, I'd like to live in London. Or we on the West Coast here, we see a movie that, that is, is shot in in New York City, and you think, oh, the action and romance of New York City. But man, if you pack up your bags and you go to Tuscany and you're sitting there and, you know, and trying to, trying to get along with the natives, you're going to discover, I'm an American in a foreign land. That's what you're going to discover. When you go into New York, you're going to say, I'm a, I'm a Californian, man. These, dude, these guys are off the wall. You're going to, you're having a, you'll just have a different, different response. It's true because when you leave your, your home for another home, when you leave your land for another land, when you give up your experience as he did to go someplace, that's a, that's a major thing. That's a sacrificial thing. He left his friends. He left his neighbors. 
That means he, he sacrificed the fellowship that he had with these people. He even left his extended family. But he did that because he had been called to do that. He did that because he was following the Lord. And as he follows the Lord, we know that God demands complete surrender. We know that God doesn't negotiate when he says, follow me. We don't go and negotiate with him. You know, I will follow you eight to five. I will follow you, you know, just when I wake up and, and when I get home from work. Or we don't negotiate our hours. We follow him because that's a basic, uh, basic part of being a follower of the Lord. Especially in the New Testament, it's a basic element of being a Christian. Jesus in Matthew, in chapter 10, verses 37 through 39, said it like this. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me isn't worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. When I gave my heart to the Lord, I knew that when I came home at the age of 20, that I was taking the chance of losing a relationship with my mom and my dad. I knew that. I knew that I was taking the chance of losing relationship with my brother Frank, and I knew that I was taking the chance of losing relationship with my two sisters. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the people I used to hang with, my friends, were going to either come to Christ or, or abandon me. I knew all of that. I, I counted the cost. I made a decision. For me to be with Christ and nobody else was, was the most important thing. And if other people would come, that would be wonderful. But I made the decision at the age of 20 that I would follow the Lord, and that meant if I had to be by myself, so be it. Well, that's what Abraham did. And notice with me, he went out not knowing where he was going. All he initially knows is that he's going to afterward, as it says here in verse 8, receive an inheritance. It's going to be something that will happen Later on, he just knew what he was supposed to do, and he did that. Oh, I don't know how many times. I don't think I've shared this with this church more than a couple times over the last 25 years or more. Some of you know this, perhaps. Before I became a Calvary Chapel pastor... I was invited to become a youth pastor in a Pentecostal church. The uh, pastor who had performed my wedding ceremony, Noel Weiss, very nice man, was from Melody Land, a church that was in Anaheim. He was an assistant there. And Marie and I had gotten to know him through my mom and my dad. And so when we got married, we asked if he would perform our ceremony for us, and he had performed my brother's wedding ceremony the week before. When my brother got married, I turned to Marie, and I said to her, we might as well, let's just get married next week. And we did. I mean, you know, as I look back now over all of these years, I think, how stupid was that? I mean, I do. I, I look back at it now thinking, why did I do that? But my brother got married. I was his best man. Noel was doing the wedding. And, uh, and I had broken up with Marie. I had taken the engagement ring back from her. I, I had broken our engagement, and I had said to her, I'll give it back to you if you want it, <laughs> if you want it, um, when we get married. Because we had been engaged for a long time, and I was dragging my heels. I didn't know if I wanted to get married, and it was starting to hurt her, and I was starting to feel like a real jerk. And so one day I, I, I remember saying, you know, Marie, I am not ready to get married. Um, may I have my ring back? Did you know that? You girls love me, huh? <laughs> I'm the kind of guy you dream about, right? <laughs> so she hands me the, the ring back. And I said, I'll give it back to you when we get married. It's putting too much pressure on me. And I, I don't know if I'm not ready. I don't want to get married. But anyway, my brother gets married. And I'm there in the wedding, the best man. And after the wedding, I talked to Marie. The next day, actually, I talked to Marie. And I said, let's just get married next week. No fanfare, 
People who want to come can come. Those who don't want to come within a week, they're not our friends anyway. Who cares? Isn't that terrible? But that's, I give them a warning. If they're my friend, they'll show up. If they're not, so what? Send the check. <laughs> so we got married. We got married. Well, Noel Weiss was the guy who did the wedding for us. And so uh, we got married in my parents' backyard, and um, off we went, and the rest is history. But Noel started a church in Hacienda Heights, and he called me up, and he said, David, I need a youth pastor. Would you be the youth pastor in my church? I had just been told by the senior pastor of the Calvary Chapel I was assisting in that he was going to ordain me into ministry as a Calvary pastor. That was back in 1979. And so I told Noel, I said, Noel, you know what? I appreciate your confidence in me. I'm, I'm flattered that you would ask me to be your youth pastor. Now, I've been asked by Calvary Chapel to go as an assistant pastor with them, and that's what I'm going to do. All of that had taken place within like a week. The pastor had said, we're going to ordain you, and I had formally said, this is where I'm supposed to be. You see, Noel started that church, and then within a year, he left it in the hands of his assistant. It's very possible that I could have been the senior pastor over a Pentecostal church in Hacienda Heights if the Lord hadn't orchestrated my steps in a different direction. All I knew is that the Lord was leading me to a place that I wasn't aware of. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know the journey, in other words, that God had before us, before Marie and me. All I knew is afterward, I'd receive whatever it was that God wanted. So I understand a very, in a small way, what's going on in the heart of, uh, of Abraham being called out and, and taken to a place that he's not even aware of. And so he didn't know where he was going, but what he did is he simply took God at his word. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm 37, verse 23 says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. So God will lead you step by step. I don't need, in other words, and neither do you, God's entire plan. What you need is to know what you're to do right now. If you know what you're to do right now, then the rest is given to you piecemeal over a lifetime. And that's what took place with him. So notice verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And so notice it says here in verse 9, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country. The word sojourn means to dwell in a place as a stranger. To sojourn is a temporary stay. It's a brief period of residence. The thought is Abraham lived in the land that God promised him but never settled in permanently. When you look at his life in the book of Genesis, you'll discover that he never owned personal property other than a cave he bought in order to bury his wife Sarah in it. You say that, see that in Genesis 23. You also know that he sojourned. That means he never adopted the ways of those around him. He didn't adopt their morals, their religion, their worldview. He didn't try to fit in. You know, every once in a while, and I'm no fan of Madonna, to be honest with you, but I get really intrigued when I hear her try to speak like a British person because she has this weird accent, and she trips me out. I go, boy, that, that girl's something else because she's an American living in England, trying to sound British. He never did that. He didn't try to adopt their accents. He didn't adopt their morals or religion. He didn't adopt their worldview. He never settled in permanently. He, as a matter of fact, he would be always at war with their way of life because he knew God had called him to be something else. And so, as Christians, we're to be careful not to adopt the worldview of unbelievers. We are in this world. That's true. But we are not of this world. There's a difference. There's a difference being in the world and of the world. We live here, of course, but we don't take our cues from the world. In John 15, verse 19, Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you.
You see, we too have a promised land, and we are called to follow the steps of Jesus Christ to that place. And as we follow him, we are not to be settled in comfortably here. Why? Because we look for another city. You can use something or you can abuse something. You can own something or it can own you. As believers, we know there's something better. So I can use this world, but I will not misuse it. I will use this world, but I'm not going to adopt its morals. In other words, you know, there are styles and things, you know, that are up to date to some degree. I'm going to stay within those styles. You know, I don't come up here dressed like a 1960s hippie anymore, though I am comfortable in that way. And I do see uh, what goes around comes around. It trips me out sometimes to see the new patterns and things that are coming out that they're calling new. And Marie was saying, just yesterday, Marie was saying, this is the stuff that we used to wear in 1970. Yeah, it was ugly then. It's ugly now. But, you know, <laughs> that's the way it is, you know. But we, we know that we're not to settle in. In 1 John, in chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, John said it this way. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, does not come from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So we have a promised land. We are waiting for a city which, foundations, uh, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. We are looking for heaven. We are just passing through. We're not to be firmly attached to this place here. We're, we can't take anything with us. The only thing that we have that goes be before us is, is what we lay up in heaven as treasures. And, and, and so we know that. And so he had a, a greater promise than what the world had to offer him. And, and that's the example that God has given to us in Abraham, a man who didn't get attached to the world, a man who was a very wealthy man, but who made decisions that were based on, on what is best for me in eternity, not for the right now and the here. Now, he had a wife, verse 11. Her name was Sarah. It says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. She bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She was 90 years old. Imagine that, ladies. Imagine your husband looking at you romantically, and he's 100. Hey, baby. I mean, think about that. They were old. I, I don't know. Anyway, I... Now, when she heard the Lord speaking, Lord God speaking to her husband Abraham, God had said, this time next year, your wife is going to have a baby. The Bible says that Sarah heard and laughed, and that God, overhearing her laugh, said to her, why did you laugh? She's in a tent, and God is outside speaking to uh, her husband. He says, this time next year, your wife is going to give birth. And she laughs within herself, God hearing her laugh. Why did you laugh? Actually, Actually, when you read that account, God speaks to Abraham and asks, why did she laugh? Because he was her covering, and so the Lord went straight to the husband. Oh, man, poor Abraham. But then he says to her, why did you laugh? And she says, and this is a conversation taking place between the Lord, a tent separating him from her. And so she's talking to God through this tent. Now, that's so unusual for, for someone to overhear conversation of somebody else in another room and actually to be speaking. I know that would never happen today. No woman would, would ever overhear a conversation and laugh within herself. I realize this is just Sarah. She's a real sinful person. But she starts speaking to the Lord, and she says, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did laugh. Can you lie to God? Can you lie to God? I didn't lie. Yes, you did laugh. I heard you laugh. And the Lord spoke to her in such a way and, and said, you know, and you've heard me say this many times, uh, and so that you'll see that I am true to my word and all, you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Every time she called her son, she would remember her laughter of unbelief. But the fact is, and I want you to see this in verse 11, 
By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Ninety years old, so far beyond the ability the normal to have a child. And God said, you are going to conceive in a natural fashion. And the Bible says she received strength. Now, the strength that she received, do you think it was physical strength alone? I mean, just think about it, ladies. How'd you like to be 90 years old walking around a supermarket pregnant? Can you imagine that for a moment? We won't go there, but... <laughs> what happened to you? Anyway, my, hun my husband is 100 years old. Think about that for a minute. But was it physical? Was it physical strength? She received strength that was spiritual. She was persuaded by the faith of her husband. And as a result of that, judges him faithful who gave the promise. And she willingly went through whatever was necessary to have this child. And so she's a model of faith, a woman who cooperated with God and bore a child when she was 90 years old. So he says in verse 12, therefore from one man and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And so when he says that he was as good as dead, he was long past the ability to procreate. He was past that. But God gave him a promise. And when God gave him the promise, he acted on the promise and was capable of impregnating his wife, and they received that promise. What a model of faith. Faith is optimistic. This is a man who took God at his word. God had said it, that settled it, and God blessed him as a result of that. Faith is optimistic. When uh, Abraham is referred to in the book of Romans, if you take notes, it's found in chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. Paul says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That's faith. I know that my body is not capable of doing this. I know that my wife's womb is dead. She's incapable of, of, of having a child. I know that she's long past uh, uh, her menopause and all, and yet God did an incredible miracle. And Oh, by the way, God still does miracles. It wasn't that long ago that I dedicated a baby born to one of the women in our fellowship. And she gave me permission when I dedicated this baby to share her story. I don't believe she'd have a problem with me doing it tonight. We called her Sarah because she was 40 years old when she became pregnant with this baby. And so this is what happened. She had had her tubes tied. And yet, at the age of 40, had conceived. And it was like, oh my, the operation wasn't successful. We thought that it was. And so, when she was in the process of giving birth, and after she gave birth to her son, she told the doctor, after I give birth, please go in and once again tie my tubes. And so... After she came out of the, uh, the operation and was able to talk to the doctor, the doctor said to her, I need to tell you something. He said, when I went in to redo the, the tubal, he says, when I went in, I discovered that your tubes were separated by two inches. It is impossible for you to have had a child. You didn't need to have your tubes redone because they were far enough away that it is impossible for you to conceive. And he said, this is a baby that was just, it was just going to be born. It's a miracle baby, a miracle baby. I dedicated a baby 
uh, of a woman who was incapable of having a child and her husband who had had a vasectomy 10 years before. And there they are standing, getting their baby dedicated, like, how'd that happen? It's a miracle. You know, it was one of those things. And so, now this is something that people say, oh, I don't believe that. You know, the Lord has a way of doing things. He does. And what they did is they trusted the Lord, Abraham and Sarah. He trusted him, and God blessed. Notice in verse 12, it says, Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars. Now, that would include not just his offspring. It wouldn't include simply Israel, the nation of Israel, because Abraham is the father of Israel. But that includes those who have the faith of Abraham. According to Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, uh, those who believe are children of Abraham. According to Galatians 3, 13 and 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And so when he says, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of heaven, that includes all who would come to faith in Christ, who have faith like Abraham, who believes God and it's counted as righteousness. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them." So these all died in faith. When he says these, he's speaking of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, those who are of his lineage. They all died with faith in God intact. They never received those promises. They saw them afar off. God had promised innumerable offspring. The most they ever saw were children and grandchildren. They didn't see the immensity of the promise uh, come to pass in their lifetime. And yet, by faith, they received the promises not only of children, but also the promise that Messiah would be brought. They did not visibly see their Messiah's ministry, but they embraced the reality of it. How do we know that? Well, Jesus spoke that way in John chapter 8. In verses 56 through 59, he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You're not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him. You've seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. He saw afar off the promise of God that would be fulfilled in Messiah who would come from him. So what is the fruit of this faith? It's a life. It's a life detached from concern for the world. Notice they're referred to as strangers, which is foreigners or aliens. They're spoken of as pilgrims. That's one who comes from a foreign country into a city or a land to reside there by the side of natives. And we look at heaven as being our native country. You see, before we're saved, we're strangers and foreigners. That's what Ephesians 2.19 says. You are no, now you are no more strangers and foreigners. You are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Before we get saved, we're actually outside of the promises of God and the people of God. But when we commit ourselves to the Lord, we become part of his family. And what we're doing, according to verse 14, is de declaring plainly that we have a homeland that we're seeking. The world's not our home. We are longing for something better. We're longing for heaven. Sometimes, just this just happened just a couple days ago. Sometimes I will see something that will touch my heart. I'll, I'll read something that takes place in, in, in another country often where a child is starving to death or something terrible happens to that baby. And, and sometimes in the news you'll see these things. And, and when I see those things, I get a, a, a hopeless feeling sometimes, a helpless feeling, not so much hopeless, a helpless feeling. And I think, Lord, how long? You know, sometimes I, I'll see children who are, starving to death. I mean, there are kids who have, if they had uh, some vitamins, they'd be able to survive their childhood, but they don't because they don't have some simple vitamins. 
Some children are dying of malaria. People die of malaria, something that they don't have to die of. But because the United States years ago banned the use of DDT and, and told people that it isn't any good, then whole nations have mosquitoes that are carrying malaria and various other kinds of disease, uh, mosquitoes that could be wiped out with the use of DDT. But because people have said that it's bad and it causes certain harmful responses when it's used, it was banned for many years. And whole nations that could have wiped out malaria and various things that are carried by uh, mosquitoes and, and that kind of um, pest have suffered because of that. I can remember growing up in the 50s where they would come through neighborhoods and they would spray <laughs> through the neighborhood. Some of you are old enough to remember that. Some of you are so old you forget. Let me remind you. <laughs> but they used to come through the neighborhoods and they used to spray. They'd spray this, this it was like smoke. And, and people would be eating their picnic lunches, and they'd be covered in the smoke, and children would run in the smoke. That was DDT. It didn't harm anybody. But some people began to say, well, it does, and so it was banned. And whole nations are now um, losing babies because of those kinds of things. And, and, and now some nations are beginning to use it again because they see that it is effective. But I, I see the news, and I watch these things, and I think, my goodness, Lord. You know, when you have somebody worried about buying the latest shoes, the latest pants, the latest uh, top, the latest shirt, the latest sweater, the latest, and they're more generous for themselves than they are towards those in need, that is discouraging. It can be discouraging, to be honest with you. And I wonder about that sometimes. Uh, when I went to India for the first time, when I went to, to Manila, Philippines, when I've been into enormous cities like Mexico City, you know, and I've, I've walked through these cities and I've seen the incredible poverty and, and then you come back to the United States and you see people are upset because they don't have enough money to buy the latest Game Boy or PlayStation or people will stay up all night in order to be first in line to buy that PlayStation 3 in order that they can put it on eBay and make some money. You know, without having to work, they simply stand in line for a couple days and then they sell it for an extraordinary amount of money. America is that way. And uh, in many ways, very greedy. And, and part of the reason is, is because we're not thinking of heaven. Because earth is so attractive to us, heaven doesn't matter. I mean, you know, I want to enjoy as much as I can today. And if I die and go to heaven, that's fine. But if there's not a heaven, well, at least I enjoyed myself now. And that's the way a lot of people are. Even church people, even Christians. Abraham wasn't that way. Abraham was nothing like that. You see, he saw, he saw a city whose builder and maker was God. And he knew he was just passing through. That's why, that's why he and his, his nephew Lot could be standing on the plain, and he could be looking. Uh, on one side, he looks, and it's all dry and barren. It's like wilderness. On the other hand, on the other side, he looks, and it's green, lush, and beautiful. So he tells his, his nephew Lot, because their herdsmen are getting into some problems together. He says, look, you choose the left, I'll go to the right. You choose the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot is looking, and what does he see? You know the story. He looks at the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot says, oh, that's beautiful. That's lush. It's gorgeous. I want to go there. So where did Abraham go? He went out into the wilderness. It was okay with him. He didn't need the luxuries of the world because he, he looked for a, a city whose maker is God. And when we have that mentality, God will use us in tremendous ways. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in verse 15, he says, Truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Uh, they didn't long for what they left behind. When it says call to mind, he didn't mull over. Man, what did I leave behind? Man, I wish I wouldn't have left that behind. Boy, did I end up the rotten end of the deal here. He didn't think that way because he had a greater vision, something better. It says in verse 16, they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. His, his longing was for something permanent, and that's why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. One of these days, I want to hear Matthew 25, 23 spoken to me, where it says, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That is the only thing 
that ultimately is going to matter. That's the only thing that's going to matter. If we can get that in our hearts when we're younger, it changes the course of our entire life. But if we wait until we're older, until we finally get that, we will look over a life and regret all the opportunities that we never took advantage of because we're so busy trying to get something for ourselves right now. Abraham wasn't that way. Abraham said, I want something that endures. And it was by faith that he embraced the promises of God and by faith, he entered into the promised land of God. He lived on the earth as a sojourner, as a foreigner, as a pilgrim, because he looked for a city that was heavenly, and that is what motivated his entire course of his life. If I have heavenly vision, if I have a goal to be there, then everything else fades by comparison, and I have a singleness of vision, and this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I can press towards those things that are before. And that's what God has called us to do, to actually know there's a heaven and live as if that is our destination.